Consider for a moment remarks that denigrate women, humiliation in full public view, and universities pulling strings to disadvantage female students. There's nothing new about any of that, and indeed, sexism in all its guises can be committed even unwittingly by the best intentioned among us. But what if I tell you that in Japan, this kind of behavior has not only become pervasive, deeply ingrained and routine over decades, but that the whole rotten mess is approved by the top echelons of society? Hello and welcome to today's show. My name is Wang Xu, and I'm the bureau chief in Tokyo for China Daily. As you may know, in Japan, the mistreatment of women is something that goes hand in hand with its history. The Nanjing Massacre of 1937 and scientific experimentation on live humans in China by the notorious Unit 731 are just two of the most well-known atrocities carried out in the name of the Empire of Japan. Think also of its policy of turning women into child breeders to feed its ambitions of imperialistic expansion and of creating an army of sexual slaves hideously dubbed comfort women. Japan doesn't just turn a blind eye to these and other atrocities, but actively denies them, underlining not only its unwillingness to face up to its past, but also to the prevalence of gender inequality in the country to the present day. In this episode, we are looking at women's rights in Japan. With this key principle in mind, the problem is not to find the answer, it's to face the answer. Let's first look at the Olympic Games in Tokyo last year. As you will recall, these were due to be held in 2020, but were put back a year because of the pandemic. One thing that made them so special, of course, was the near-empty stadiums and arenas in which events were held. But there were a lot of other things that put the Tokyo Games in the headlines. Five months before the opening ceremony, the head of the Games Organizing Committee, Yoshiro Mori, was forced to resign after saying at one of his meetings that women's speaking time should be limited because they talk too much. But if you think that the former Japanese Prime Minister's resigning means he was sorry for what he had said, think again. In other remarks, Mori made him seem to be utterly unapologetic. Instead, he insisted that his remarks were not meant to demean women and that he had been misunderstood. In fact, the 83-year-old accused his critics of disrespecting the elderly and reckoned the whole thing was just a media beat-up. A month later, Mori was up to his old tricks again, this time at a party for a politician in Tokyo at which he referred to a political aide as way too old to be called a woman. And surprisingly, Mori hit the headlines again, with some saying he deserved a good medal for sexism. But in a way, Mori's remarks are not surprising, given that they are the product of someone who grew up in a Japan in which gender roles were firmly fixed. Husbands, some of them so-called salary men, went to work each day as their wives stayed home to take care of so-called women concerns. Not surprising either that Japan has an atrocious record on gender equality, placing 120 out of 156 countries in a ranking by the World Economic Forum, even after years of government promises to change things. In fact, discrimination and women being abused are so common in Japan that many people have simply got used to it. One emblematic instance of this has to do with family names. A name, of course, is a critical part of a person's identity and possibly even self-worth. But any woman in Japan marrying is forced by law to adopt her partner's name. Of course, millions of Japanese would love people to have the right to choose the name they want to use. But last year, the country's Supreme Court backed a 2015 decision and reiterated that forcing women to adopt their husband's name is in line with the country's lack of a due surname system for married couples. In 2018, nine Japanese medical schools were found to have manipulated admissions to exclude female applicants. Among them, the prestigious Tokyo Medical University had tampered with scores of female applicants over many years. An investigation by the newspaper Asahi Shimbun said at least 10 universities had conducted inappropriate entrance exams, meaning applicants were treated differently based on characteristics including gender or age. Another newspaper, Yomiuri Shimbun, 
quoted an unnamed source saying officials of one university had what was called a silent understanding to reduce the number of female entrants over concerns that many women would not go into medical practice but give birth and raise children. One university brazenly defended itself by saying that it needed to set the bar higher for women because they are better than men in communicating and would have an advantage in face-to-face -face interviews. Another instance of women being treated badly is the country's antiquated rape law. That was overhauled four years ago and included harsher penalties, but it left intact controversial requirements that prosecutors must prove that violence or intimidation was involved or that the victim was incapable of resistance. Little surprise, perhaps, a report a few years ago by the government's Gender Equality Bureau showed that nearly 60% of female victims of forced sex kept it to themselves. Behind the legal burden is a traditional view that women are responsible for protecting their chastity, and the rape law was adopted even before women could vote. In fact, its principal aim was not to protect women, but to protect family honor and pedigree. Almost 10 years ago, the former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe vowed to create a society in which women can shine. And when he said it, many believed that centuries of patriarchal dominance was finally in its death throes. All this time later, tens of millions of Japanese are still waiting for that change to come. That's it from me today. We'll see you again soon.